Good evening. Good to see everybody and glad that you're here. Those of you joining us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, way of announcements, um, <clears throat> once again, this Sunday, uh, we're going to plan to have uh, Baptist Men's Day. It snowed us out last week. Not didn't snow us completely out, but snowed us out enough we decided not to do Men's Day. And uh, so we did have service, and I, we had uh, good, good attendance. Appreciate everybody that's here. and know a lot of understand reasons people didn't get out, and we had about twice that many, maybe three times that many online too. So uh, we had a, had a good group, and we enjoyed it, had a good service. But this Sunday, Lord willing, uh, we'll have Baptist Men's Day during our worship service. Ed Kroon, who is now, he was uh, formerly uh, superintendent of our schools, he is now the president of Mount Olive University. They used to be Mount Olive College, but they went uptown. Now they're Mount Olive University, and uh, he is the president of that. He's supposed to be here to speak for us. So let's hope that the weather cooperates and the snow and ice whatever stays north or east of us. Uh, Sunday school at its regular time. And also, uh, this Sunday, we're having the first one of our community men's breakfast again. We used to do that every fifth Sunday. Uh, several churches in the community, we're going to begin that back up this week, and that will be at Holly Springs. Uh, any of you men that would like to, uh, to participate in that are going to eat about 8 o'clock. Uh, and I look forward to that. So uh, uh, all that works. And, of course, if anything changes relative to weather, we will send out a text and put a, a notice on uh, Facebook about it also and uh, advise you what we do. Uh, Lord willing, one way or another, we'll try to have church. Um, any other announcements? If not, I wonder before we uh, share in prayer if there are those that you would like to mention for us to remember. Oh my goodness. Mm. Right, okay. Now how's your mom from where she fell? She doing okay? She's okay. Okay, let's continue. Continue to remember her also. My surgery is at 8.15 Friday morning. Friday morning at 8.15. Let's remember Debbie. She's having a robot installed. <laughs> Something, something like that anyway. So, uh, and Thrasher, high level, they had taught at the Bible schools mm -hmm. for such a long time he died. Yeah, passed away, I believe, Monday, Monday no. Saturday. Last Saturday, yeah. And uh, so, just remember that family. Um, Fred here, and they moved him from the hospital today to, uh, uh, a rehab facility in Garner, and I don't know the name of it, but he's there right now, uh, temporarily anyway. So uh, continue to remember him and Evelyn and uh, and Beverly, because she's really had a load on her taking care of all that. So let's remember her. Um, Dan supposed to go find out something this week, this week, next week, sometime Friday. So uh, he's visiting somebody to tell him that his pain is not real. <laughs> and he's taking a boxing glove with him to punch the guy right in the nose when he tells him. He a gun. <laughs> well, so we. While we're talking about pain, be exercising is not my heels, it's muscles. Okay. They got me doing exercises. And I ain't been doing them. I mean, I've been doing them, but not that long. A little bit of improvement, maybe, but. You videoing that? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Uh, Kathy uh, Elmore's uh, son, Jason, is at home now, so let's uh, let's continue to pray for him. He hope for a complete recovery from the surgery he had. Can you remember Brad? They're trying to take care of his kidney stones and his Crohn's now, but he's been having trouble with it for his body. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Let's keep Brad on our prayer list. Sure. I will pick what it was involved with Yeah. Had an accident here with a, between a bus and a, another vehicle. Just remember, all those. Others, anybody that don't want to look anybody if we help it. Right. Okay, let's remember Ted and pray that he don't have anything. Okay. Anybody else? Mitch, if you will, lead us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, dear Lord. We uh, have many requests, but we are certainly thankful for all that you do for us, dear Lord. We are, we are certainly blessed, blessed as a, a people, our community, dear Lord, a country. And dear Lord, we, we still live in the greatest country on earth, but please be with our leadership, dear Lord. We want to pray for them, pray for them to make the right decisions, the right decisions, dear Lord, that would be pleasing to you and honoring you, dear Lord, that we could uh, honor you, dear Lord, as a, as a country, dear Lord, and come back to you. And dear Lord, still uh, get on that knee, dear Lord, beneath the cross, dear Lord, and, and show humbleness, dear Lord, and, and how much we do love you. So just be with all the people that, that have been mentioned tonight, dear Lord. There are so many that are, that are sick, dear Lord, and Please be with Brother Fred. I know he's having a tough time. Um, just be with those and the caregivers around him, dear Lord, the family. Just have your hand upon them. So many people, dear Lord, that they're having procedures that uh, are coming up just right here in this room, dear Lord. Please please be with them. Be with the surgeons, dear Lord. Be with those that are, are looking at the, the charts, dear Lord. Help them to, to, to see the right path, dear Lord, to, to help, uh, help everyone, dear Lord. And just... Uh, be with all of us to, to put our, our arms and uh, around our brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord, and reach out to everybody with phone calls, love, dear Lord, and prayers so that we can let everyone know, dear Lord, that we're, uh, we're, we're supporting them, dear Lord, we're praying for them, dear Lord, just be with, uh, be with us, dear Lord, to, um, to come together. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this time that we have for Bible study, dear Lord, so we can... We can take the things that that you have uh, given to Tim, that's laid on Tim's heart, dear Lord. That, that we can we can study this word, dear Lord. And we're in a free country; we can study. And, uh, and dear Lord, help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to, to soak it in, just like a sponge, dear Lord, so that we can we can make it through the rest of the week, dear Lord. Because it is a it's a tough tough time sometimes with the the busy times that we have in our lives, dear Lord. Help us to always stop for a moment and always, uh, dear Lord, have a, a time of prayer and, and, and Bible study for you each and every day, dear Lord. Help us forgive us for all of our shortcomings, dear Lord, and just be with Tim as he does bring the message. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Have your Bibles and invite you to turn to the book of Jude. We are at verse 12 tonight. That'd be chapter 1 in the, verse of, in the book of Jude, or chapter only, uh, as the case might be. Uh, Jude is a uh, short book. It's a book that, uh, that you could easily overlook when you're reading along. You just flip through. In fact, if, you, uh, uh, if you're not looking for it, you probably would not ever wind up at the book of Jude. A lot of times, it's immediately before the book of Revelation, so a lot of people jump right to Revelation. They want to read that. The book of Jude is... Uh, is an intentional book. Uh, we looked at the first couple of weeks. We've talked about how the Jude had the intention that he was going to write something that was going to be encouraging to the people that were Christians, but the Lord spoke to him, and he was uh, aware of what was happening and realized that he needed to write him a book of warning. He needed to write him a book of challenge and a book to call a call to arms, if you will, and we've looked at that so far. And as we're going to continue, Jude is going to describe for us 
exactly uh, what it is that, uh, that, that they're up against. And so in verse 12 and 13, he gives a, a specific uh, description of uh, these apostates, or uh, you, could, uh, you could call them false Christians or counterfeit Christians. Um, I was reading somewhere about counterfeiters. They said that, uh, I don't know if you, if you realize, most of us do, we don't think about it, but the Secret Service is actually the ones that are responsible for uh, counterfeiters. And uh, people that, the people that are the, the most uh, adept at, at spotting a counterfeit bill are not people that study counterfeits. They're people that study real bills. Uh, if you go to uh, if you go to a bank, I mean, you, you I could probably well I couldn't because I'm not smooth enough. But if somebody that that's a, a crook could probably pass a counterfeit bill to you. They might mix it in with three or four more, and you would take it and not even pay attention to it. But if you go to the bank and a and a teller that's used to handling, they'll flip across those and just fast as they can go. And when they hit that one that's wrong, it feels different. That they can tell there's something unique about. It. Well, that's what Jude I think is trying to help us to understand. The way to see the false is to compare it to the real. And so that's what he does in these two verses that we're going to look at tonight, verse 12 and verse 13. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, laid autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, there's some specific things that, that Jude points out here that ought to be the part of a Christian's life that are missing here. Uh, the first thing that he does is he points out the fact, as he already has done, that these who are here in, in one of the earlier verses, he says they crept in unaware they're right in the middle of it and and he uses and that that uh verse these are spots in your love feast the, uh, the new living translation translate that verse when these people eat with you in your fellowship meals sir uh, commemorating the lord's love they are like dangerous reefs and that's actually if you go back and you study uh the the language words that word spot and a word uh, for, for a reef or for a hidden rock that was, that was just under the surface is the same thing. And what he's saying here is that these people are dangerous and often they're unnoticed. Um, probably the most uh, famous uh, shipwreck in all of history is the wreck of the Titanic. Uh, most everybody knows a little bit about that. They made several movies about it, and all the last one was was really cool, really cool movie. Except for the guy that froze to death there at the end, floating on the door. But um, but it the the the, sh the ship was unsinkable. I mean, the guy that made it, you know, and and uh, early along in the way somewhere, he's bragging about the fact that that the ship, you know, uh, God Himself couldn't sink that ship. I don't know. I think I shared with y'all one time. I went down to uh, to Wrightsville Beach. Right after they had rebuilt uh, the pier down there, that's the concrete pier. Is it Johnny Mercer's pier? Is that the name of? I think that's the name of down there. That's that's built out of concrete. It's like a it's like an I ninety five bridge out in the middle of the of that there. But they were they had just finished building it and they weren't they weren't open yet. And I happened to be down there uh, on a job of some type. I don't remember what it was, but I walked out there and the and a, the superintendent that was working on the job and everything. I said, "Man, can I walk out there just for a minute?" And 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 he said, "Okay." So he let me, and I walked out on it. And it's, I mean, it really is magnificent. When I came back by, I told him, I said, "You know, that's that's pretty impressive." It's kind of, he said, "Yeah, God can't knock this pier down." I said, "I can guarantee you one thing: I will never set foot on that pier again. You could not pay me." to get on that pier because that just might be the day that God wants to show them. Uh, I, the, but that's what they said about the Titanic, wasn't it? That God himself couldn't sink it. And yet you realize that in spite of what a massive ship it was, how strong it was, how well it was built, that it hit an iceberg. An uh, iceberg, and most of the, of the body of an iceberg, the bulk of an iceberg, is under the water. It's not what's above the water that's dangerous, it's what's below the water. And it hit the side of it, knocked a hole in it, sent the thing to the bottom of the ocean. And, and so uh, what, what uh, Jude says here is the first thing you have to do is to watch out for these because they will show up at your love feast. Now, the love feast is talked about here. That's a, that's a term that's used throughout the New Testament, and it describes 
a meal that was shared before they shared the Lord's Supper. It was not the actual meal of communion, but they would gather and they would fellowship. And, and I think that's where, you know, we Baptists, we caught on to that real good because we eat, I mean, with the best of them. And, and, but they would, they would gather. And, they, and one of the reasons for that, though, was in that day, there was no such thing as a middle class. There were rich people and there were poor people. And the poor people were starving to death and the rich people had plenty. And as Christians, they developed the habit they would have these feasts and the rich would bring plenty of food and they would share it with their, with their fellow Christian brothers that were poor. And so it, be, it became known as a love feast. And, and Jude says, when you have this feast, and think about it for just a minute. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about when you were riding along the road and you're hungry, just pulling over at a family reunion? Because they don't know most of the people that are there anyway. And there's plenty of food and you can eat. I mean, no, they wouldn't stop you because they don't, I mean, you just, they think you're cousin somebody. And, and so if they start asking, you, you just pick up a name and say, yeah, I'm kin to them or whatever. And if they run you off, maybe you can get a ham bone before you go. So, but, but they, they did, they would come to these feasts and they would, they would be there and they'd be in the midst of it. But it was, for them, it was not an opportunity to share love. It was an opportunity to share division. And, and the thing that the devil is about in our world today within the church is to try to divide it. If he can find a way to sow division among people, one brother against another, a friend against another, one group against another, divide everybody. And it's not just within the church. It's within our world. Think about what's, what's happening in our nation right now. Uh, the, the effort of those who are trying to, to, I think, to destroy our country or to separate people and divide people one from the other. If we can just get everybody mad at each other, before long we can tear it apart. And so these people, he said, they will come in to your love feast and they appear to be just one of you, but, uh, but underneath there is something very, very dangerous that is there. And so that's the thing that, that you notice first is uh, that there is uh, an unseen danger. Well, then the second thing he mentions in verse 12, they are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. Now, if any time, if, if it's dry, uh, if it's a drought or anything like that, a mighty good sign is a cloud in the sky, isn't it? Uh, because clouds are, are a sign that, that rain is coming. And especially if you get in a situation where, where the rain is desperately, desperately needed, man, you're glad to see them clouds building up. But you know, sometimes the clouds don't deliver any rain. Sometimes they are just an appearance. And that's what he says here, that for them, they're like clouds that blow a lot of air, a lot of hot air most of the time, and nothing else, but they don't produce anything. Listen to this verse from, from Proverbs chapter 25. Verse 14, whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. Uh, they're, they're always promising something. They're always declaring something, but it's never going to happen. Um, in the Bible, rain is one of the types or one of the symbols of the word of God. A very familiar passage to a lot of us from Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, there's within our, our world today, and unfortunately in some churches, there is a drought of knowing and understanding the Word of God. There are churches that, that gather and they do all kinds of things. They have all kinds of programs and plans and, uh, and parties and socials, and they're involved in, in trying to do good stuff out in the community, and all that's well and good. But if the church has an absence of the presence of the Word of God, we're missing the thing that's going to make us different. And he says they're, they're, like, they're, they're just like a, a wind, a cloud that's carried away uh, by the wind. And, and how often do you see... Somebody that, that every time you see them, it seems like 
they've latched on to the latest liberal fad that's coming along. It's, it's, I, this idea comes along and they, they latch on to it and this one. And, and I, I've, I, I'm just, I am amazed. I mentioned it often, but I'm amazed at how quickly in our country we have fallen prey mm -hmm. to some ideas of things that just a very short time ago we would have said that's ridiculous. Nobody would have believed it, and yet here it is, and it's more and more prevalent in what's happening. Now, Paul talked about this in a passage in Ephesians. This passage in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Now, these are the gifts. It's a long passage, but listen to me now. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, if you want to follow. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children, Listen to this now. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And he says that as we become mature, our job as pastors, as teachers, and even as Christians to one another is to teach and to help people learn. It is, it is sad, people that, that have been a Christian, and even been active in a church for years and years and years, and yet they are basically illiterate in God's Word. Uh, I mean, you, they, they, it, it, they, they really just do not know it. They grasp little bits uh, here and there, but as far as any depth of truth to it, and he says, if you do the job of teaching and sharing that, as we become mature, we will no longer be like children tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. The, the idea that, that there's a cloud and it looks like something and it sounds like something and it blows the wind, but there's nothing that comes out of it. So he's talked about uh, the, the danger, which is unseen. He talks about clouds that don't produce any rain, but then he goes on that and he talks about a tree that doesn't produce any fruit. Uh, listen to verse 12 again. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead. For they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are doubly dead, he says. Now, there, there's not much you can do with a dead tree. You can cut it down, you can burn it, you can prune it, but you will not collect any, any fruit from it. And for, for a lot of us, the trees we have in our yards are, are for looks only. And sadly, there's too many people that that would be a description of their Christian life, that it's for looks only. Because there's nothing being produced from the the real test, the real test of a of a Christian, and 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 especially a Christian ministry is is it bearing fruit? Is it is it bearing fruit? And there's two ways we bear fruit. We bear fruit in in new Christians, but we also bear fruit in the growth of Christians. And that and if that's not happening in our lives, if it's not happening in our church, then something. Is missing, and he said they're twice dead because they're dead spiritually right now, but ultimately they're going to be dead eternally also. They not only are missing something right now in this world, but their ultimate destiny uh, is uh, death as well. And so uh, they can appear, a false Christian can appear to have the knowledge. They can, they can be very smart. They can be mentally aware. They can be uh, intellectually alive, but spiritually they're dead. There's something that's missing. Listen to a couple of verses. This one from Proverbs 2 and 22. The wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. That's what Jude said. They've been uprooted. Matthew 15, 13, Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted, will be uprooted. The picture there is not only a something that's pruned back, but something that literally is uprooted 
and cast away. Uh, the, the, if, if a Christian is fruitless, it's because he's rootless. And you cannot grow. Uh, you can take, a, you can take a, a stick and stick it in the ground. And if it, if it, when you, if you cut it down and it's got some limbs on it and some leaves and everything, you can stick it in the ground and you have the appearance that you got a tree there, but you're real quick going to find out whether there's any life to it because it's going to wilt and dry up unless there's a root there because it has to draw sustenance from what it's planted in. And the same is true with a Christian. If you are a surface Christian, if you're just floating around on the surface, you're not going to be growing because you don't have a root in anything. There's nothing that, that's giving you uh, that nourishment uh, that needs to be and will cause you, uh, cause you to grow. And so uh, we see there that he, he talks about the, the clouds with no rain, trees with no fruit. And then the last thing he mentions is a star that cannot be followed. Listen to verse 13. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They're like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Now, the, the, mo the, the very first means by which men learn to navigate was the stars. But when you navigate by the stars, you have to understand the stars. I don't really. I'm, I, I love to go out at night. Last night uh, was a, a real clear night. When we first got home, uh, I went to the mailbox, and, uh, and I looked up, and the sky, and when it's cold, it seems like the, the sky is clearer than ever, and it was black and the stars just shining, and it was amazing. And it didn't take me but just a minute to enjoy it, and I went back inside because it was cold. <laughs> but, but I, you know, in the summertime, though, I'll, I'll stay out and enjoy it. But, but stars, somebody that knows the stars, though, they can predict where the star is going to be, and based on where it is, they know where they're going to be. And, and they will always go back to what's called the North Star because the North Star is at, it, is at its same place all the time. The whole rest of the stars... Uh, move around it, but it never moves. It's always where it is. Well, instead, he talks here about a wandering star, which would be something that's all over the place. And in fact, uh, we have what we call sometimes a shooting star, which is not really a star at all, uh, but a meteor, and it, and it breaks loose from orbit. And when it does, it starts flying, and it will zip across the sky. I mean, it's impressive, but you know what happens to it? It burns up. It burns up because it, it, has no, it has no purpose, it has no orbit, and it will fly across the sky, but very quickly uh, it will crash and it will burn up. It's brilliant, but it's very short-lived. And, a, and a, a, a counterfeit Christian is like that. Sometimes they're, they, are, uh, they may flash up real bright, but before long they burn up and they're gone and they're out of sight. And so we want to learn for ourselves to, to watch for these things, to watch for, for that danger which is under the surface. It's not right there. It can't easily be seen. It can't always easily be detected. But you notice when you see that, that, that the lack of fruit, the fact that, that there's clouds without rain, that there's trees without fruit, fruit that all that has taken place uh, becomes a danger sign for us. And based upon that, then we see that that's something we need to stay away from. And, and one of the things that... Uh, I think the church is going to have to um, is going to have to find a way to be more active in, and that is is kind Christian discipline, because the church long time ago got away from that. And there there was a time within a church that um, situations would arise. And a person was brought before the church. Didn't y'all ever remember that? And, and, and was said, listen, you know, we want you to be a part of the church, but if you're going to be a part of the church, we want you to be something. We want you to stand for something because when you go out, and, and I, have, I have said a, a, a time or two about somebody, I didn't say it to their face because I don't want to be ugly, but, you know, whoever they are, please don't tell anybody you go to our church. I, you know, don't please don't go tell anybody because I don't want that to be what people think about our church. In other words, you, you, the church needs to be something that show, that that has the the things we're talking about here that that is that is real and true. And it doesn't take but a very small minority 
to do great harm to the church, not to a church, but to the church. And, and when, you, when you're living in a world where people are constantly, and, they, and that's who they're going to point out. If you go, uh, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I have as a pastor certainly done it, is go talk to somebody about, you know, coming to church and they'll say, man, I don't want to go to church. I have such and such mm-hmm. goes down there and, I, and then they start telling you all about them or they'll just say in general, you got a bunch of hypocrites down there. Or they'll say, I'm just as good at the people at your church. Now, if they ever say that, I tell them, you're exactly right. You're just as good as any of us. I mean, none of us are good. That's not why we're there. But, but to, to try to find a way that when they look at our church, they see something good. They don't see, they don't see the weak. But in spite of that, they're going to always find the weak spot. They're always going to point it out. But we're going to be working harder and harder and harder to not be that. And like I say, I think the, the time is going to come that the church is going to have to be willing to say to people, hey, you know, if you want to be part of the church, it ought to make a difference in your life. There ought to be something to it. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't, I wouldn't ever want to be unkind or anything, but uh, man, being a Christian ought to be something we're proud of and uh, something that we stand true for. Anything to add before we close? Yeah, you made a comment about so and so the church, people in there, I don't know if I, my answer to that is, brother, sir, you let him stand between you and God. You can't worry about what he's doing, you got to worry oh, about yeah. what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. Don't hurt. <laughs> Don't hurt. Um, yesterday, there was a van in Spitfield. I think it was a white van. had a big sign on the side of it. said, Jesus is alive. And then it said, he never died. And uh, Steve Grice saw the van, followed it into Bojangles, and went inside and confronted the man and said, told him that that is not what the Bible says, that... And he asked him why he believed that, and the guy didn't, couldn't come up with a foundation for believing that. He just said that, I just do. And Steve told him, more or less after he questioned him and questioned him and told him what the Bible said, he said, you need to go to a Bible-believing church. Mm-hmm. And yep. he had that as a big sign on his van. Yeah. I like the Jesus is alive part, but I uh, need to get some paint paint over the other part. <laughs> and, and I'm not advertising it. If, you, if you're on Facebook and you're not friends with Steve Grice, I ain't saying that. But go to his site and listen to what the man is saying. He handled it very well, I think. He won't yeah. push it, right. but he stayed in the opinion. Yep. You know, I had an experience of that out there. It couldn't have off to be slaughtered. There'd be lamb slaughterhouse in the First guy I moved there. Boy, well, I can turn around and leave the man that the bush or that. When I hear me, I'd love you to ask him, did I know Jesus Christ? Really? Wow. And in the conversation was, he says, I try to ask everybody that delivers a cow here that question. We had a good conversation. We had a good celebration in the Lord. Uh, Amen. Man. Amen. You know, we, it, it'd be amazing if we were as eager to talk about the Lord as we are about a lot of other things, mm-hmm. wouldn't it? Uh, how easy it is to talk about some things and how hard it seems to be sometimes to talk about the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you this evening for the time that's ours to uh, gather and share this portion of your word. We thank you for the truths that are there. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to study through this book and we see the the signs and the, 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 the evidences there of that which is false, that it reminds us that we want to be that much more careful uh, to be genuine and to be true in our trust of you and our faith in you and in the way that we live our lives and, and seek to be an example before other people. Uh, Lord, we're, we continue to be mindful that uh, there's many around us that have needs. We mentioned a lot tonight. We continue to lift each one. We pray that through the remainder of this week, various situations in people's lives, that you'll work there, help us to be careful in ways that we can to to aid and assist one another and share in ways that we can. We ask now as you go with us as as we leave and give us safety as we're traveling back to our homes and every day that you bless us with, help us to choose to use it as wisely as we can. And we ask that you bless in a way that uh, that we'll be careful to uh, to understand it, to see it, and we ask that you continue to bless Prosper and all the things we endeavor to do as a church for our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming.